All right, so good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. If you're joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world through over 40 monthly live, free, interactive broadcasts. I want to start by saying a huge shout out to our huge audience today. We had over 260 groups from across Canada and the US register for today's program. So thank you so much in these really odd times for continuing to join us as we celebrate and showcase amazing explorers, scientists, and stories from around the globe. Of course, the reason you guys are all here is because today we continue on our cross Canada virtual road trip in partnership with Parks Canada and the Royal Canadian Geographical Society. This is stop three on this epic adventure. And over the next month, we'll be traveling virtually coast to coast to coast Host to visit some of Canada's incredible national historic sites, parks, and marine conservation areas. We're going to meet some incredible people, explore some amazing landscapes, and follow up with some ongoing conservation stories in action. I want to bring up on the screen now for you guys our full listing. If you guys want to tune in for all our programs coming up, sign up for some other ones coming in the next few weeks, or check out our YouTube channel for some of the past broadcasts we've done. That link I will leave up for the remainder of the intro. So yesterday, just yesterday, we went all the way up to the Northwest Territories to the Pingo National Landmark in Northern Northwest Territories. And we are traveling 6,000 kilometers across Canada. We are such a big country today to learn about the quarantine at Gros Eel. So for 105 years, the Gros Eel Quarantine Station played a central role in fighting the spread of contagious diseases introduced into Canada by ships of people uh, on their immigration journey through the port of Quebec. The development of the Grosiel Quarantine Station helped to advance scientific medical knowledge and technology. Get ready to explore the science and immigration history of Grosiel's Quarantine Station and how the lessons and practices of the past have changed and impacted us today. You'll even get to see the islanders who shaped the history of the Quarantine Station and immigration to Canada. And so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Shadi at Gros Eel. Uh, take us away, Shadi. Thank you so, so much for joining us. And I can't wait to learn all about this amazing place. Hello everyone, thank you Jesse, and uh, thank you everyone for being there this afternoon for our presentation. So welcome to this presentation of uh, Parks Canada. I will share my uh, screen immediately so that you can see uh, our presentation. So uh, this presentation is called The Quarantine at Grosil, 105 Years of Sciences. And by the way, if you have any questions during the presentation, keep them in mind or write them into the chat section and we'll try to answer most of them at the end uh, during uh, the question period. So uh, first of all, let me introduce uh, myself. My name is Shadi and I'm working as a guide and coordinator at Grosil and the Irish Memorial National Historic Site. I'm working for Parks Canada. So what's Parks Canada? It's an, an organization of the Canadian government uh, whose mandate is to protect and present examples of our country's natural and cultural heritage. So when we're talking of natural heritage, it can be as simple as uh, trees, plants, or animals. While cultural heritage, it's a bit more complicated. It can be uh, memory of events. It can be old buildings. It can be objects or monuments. In the case of Gros Hill, uh, important uh, events took place on that island. So uh, Parks Canada protect mainly resources of cultural heritage, including buildings and monuments. So this island, Gros Hill, is a national historic site that is part of Parks Canada network. Throughout the country, there are several parks, national historic sites, or uh, conservation uh, or marine conservation areas. And that island, Gros Hill, lays right in the middle of the St. Trans River, about 50 kilometers east of Quebec City. And in fact, there is a strong connection between the island and Quebec City, since Gros Hill was the quarantine station of the port of Quebec. So what was the function of that quarantine station? It was to fight the spread of contagious diseases that might have been brought uh, by uh, the uh, boat uh, transporting immigrants uh, from Europe and uh, the rest of the world towards uh, Quebec City and Canada. So at the station, we had to inspect the boats and the immigrants to disinfect them, to take care of the sick, and uh, to uh, have uh, the healthy immigrants uh, quarantine. What is a quarantine? That's the question. So maybe a few of you have undergone uh, such a process within the last few months due to the uh, COVID-19 epidemic. So that's essentially a preventive measure. It's a detention and observation period in case symptoms of diseases develop. 
And usually at Gosil, it would last from five to 21 days, depending of uh, the disease, because each disease has a specific incubation period before the, disease, uh, the, the uh, symptoms uh, develop. So let's have a very short overview of the history of the station before we talk of our subject. So the station opened its door in 1832 due to the rise of immigration to the port of Quebec and to the spread of epidemics. Unfortunately, the first years of uh, the history of that station were marked with improvisation, disorganization, and inefficiency. It was due to the poor scientific knowledge we had about diseases at that time. But eventually, the station uh, was modernized. It became efficient and could offer quality services due to a series of technological innovations and medical progress. And finally, well, the uh, station was shut down in 1937 after uh, immigration decreased at the port of Quebec City and also due to the diminishing number of cases of contagious diseases. But the one thing you have to remind about the history of that station is that science is at the very heart of its development. We have learned a lot of lessons uh, during the history of Grosil's quarantine station. Uh, many of those lessons are still valid, and you might suspect that they are more relevant than ever in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. So let's dive into history. And let's talk about uh, the uh, first part of the history of the quarantine station, the early 1800s. This part of uh, our history is marked by a drastic rise of immigration from Europe towards North America and Canada. And I remind you that at that time in the early 1800s, Canada was still a British colony, so an English uh, colony. And Quebec was the main port of the colony, thus the main gateway for most immigrants uh, coming into uh, the colony. But at the same time, uh, Europe was facing a major cholera epidemic. What is cholera? It's a contagious and mortal disease that was characterized by strong diarrhea and vomiting. For example, the young woman you see at the center of the slide was suffering from cholera and her, her skin was bluish due to dehydration. And in fact, most people would eventually die of dehydration. So of course, uh, the authorities wanted to avoid that those immigrants bring cholera with them into Canada. So that's why uh, the Grosil quarantine station was open in 1832. But at first, uh, the crossing conditions were very hard aboard the sailboats. They were uh, absolutely not designed for the transportation of passengers. Uh, the duration of the crossing itself was very long. It could take between 45, and two, uh, 40, 45 days and two months to cross the North Atlantic Ocean uh, between Europe and North America. So it was quite long. And most of the immigrants were literally packed like cattle into the steerage of uh, the ships. So you had overcrowded boats with a lack of hygiene and unhealthy diet. It was the perfect combination uh, for the rapid spread of contagious diseases on board, diseases like cholera. And furthermore, well, science was not much advanced at that time. We still ignored the origins of diseases. And there were uh, some old medical beliefs, like uh, the theory of miasmas. So people thought that there were some kinds of fumes of evil and stinking particles like devils floating in the air and that were responsible for the spread of, it, of, of, of diseases. And only by breathing those particles, you could become sick and catch a disease. So that's why at that time, most physicians would recommend ventilation, uh, good behavior or the use of perfumes to get rid of uh, bad smells and to fight miasmas. And there were also very dangerous treatments at that time. For example, people used purgatives for inducing vomiting. Uh, they used bloodletting uh, for inducing bleeding. And uh, some toxic substances also were given to patients, always uh, with the same aim, restoring the balance of liquids into the body. But you might suspect that the result was not really convincing. Uh, so science was not efficient at all, and mortality was very high at that time. Now, I'd like to draw your attention on uh, the picture you see at the center of the slide. You see the costume of a bird. Those costumes were worn by physicians during the Middle Age. So in the mask, they would put perfumes and herbs to uh, repel bad smells and get rid of miasmas. 
So those were the beliefs at that time. And of course, it had several consequences on the organization of the Grossil quarantine station. So uh, we poorly under uh, understood the concept of contagion. Uh, so that's why both sick and healthy immigrants were kept into the same small area in the west of the uh, island. And the result uh, was mass contamination because there was only a small fence separating the shelters of the healthy from the hospital uh, for the sick. Uh, think about it. It's like if nowadays uh, we had all uh, the patients suffering uh, of COVID-19 into the same hospital rooms than the other patients. Of course, the result would be mass contamination. Another example uh, is the Irish tragedy of 1847. So that year, there are almost 100,000 Irish immigrants, mostly, who try to reach Quebec City. But the problem is that they were already weakened by famine and by a disease called typhus. This disease was quite frequent aboard the ships since it was transmitted by lice jumping from person to another uh, into small areas like the steerage. So thousands of Irish immigrants arrived already sick at Grossil and the shelters were uh, rapidly overcrowded. That's why 12 emergency shelters called Lazaretto were rapidly built. You can see them under construction at the center of the slide. And despite all the efforts of the employees of the station, unfortunately, more than 5,000 immigrants, mostly Irish, died in 1847. And they were buried into a mass grave now called the Irish Cemetery. So now let's take a look to the past and uh, let's go into the Lazarettos from 1847 with our first video. Bonjour, papa. Bonjour, mon enfant. Alors, comment va la construction de ces Lazarets? Serons-nous bientôt prêts à y loger ces immigrants abrités sous les tentes et à bord des navires? Nous en avons quatre de complétés. D'ici ce soir, nous pourrons y loger près de 600 immigrants bien portants. Venez voir par vous-même. La traversée fut des plus épouvantes pour beaucoup de ces immigrants, tous entassés les uns contre les autres. Il faut dire que la plupart sont déjà bien habillés depuis leur départ de Rome. Il est impératif de sauver les âmes des gens encore en santé pendant qu'il en est temps. Il est également essentiel de les loger dans des bâtiments bien aérés pour nous aider à nous débarrasser de ces sataniniasmes. Nous redoublons d'efforts, même si ceux-ci ne semblent pas suffire. J'en suis bien conscient. Ce matin seulement, j'ai dû offrir l'extrême onction à près d'une cinquantaine de ces immigrants. Mais ne perdons pas l'espoir. Le bon docteur Douglas redouble d'efforts pour offrir les ressources nécessaires au bien-être de ces immigrants. Mais bon, je vous laisse à votre besogne. Et que le Seigneur soit avec vous. Merci, mon père. Nous en avons bien besoin. So we're now back to our presentation. So you saw those Lazarettos from 1847. The conditions were very harsh and hard, uh, but fortunately, uh, that situation has improved gradually in the second half of the 1800s due to the technological and scientific revolution. Uh, let's talk first about uh, the medical field with uh, the work of uh, the famous French scientist Louis Pasteur. He's the one who discovered uh, the existence of microbes in the 1870s, and he also proved the contagious nature of those diseases. It means that those diseases, well, they can be transmitted from a person to another through microbes. So this work by Louis Pasteur led to the development of a preventive medicine. It means that it's focused on the prevention of diseases through two techniques, vaccines and asepsis. Now, what is asepsis? It's simply the fact of preventing contamination of a surface by microbes in order to stop the spread of diseases through, uh, for example, disinfection or the use of sterilized medical uh, equipment. And you can see that those two concepts, vaccines and the sepsis, well, uh, obviously they are still at the heart of our efforts to fight uh, COVID-19. 
Now, at the same time, in the 1870s, uh, most of the old sailboats were gradually replaced by steamships. Those new ships uh, were uh, specifically designed for the transportation of passengers, they were fast, large, more comfortable, and there were uh, all the necessary commodities on board. Here's an example, the Titanic. Titanic was a steamer, but don't worry, most of those steamers uh, were more reliable than the Titanic. Uh, even the duration of uh, the journey at sea was shorter. It would take only between five to ten days to cross uh, the North Atlantic. And aboard the ships, you would usually find three separate classes of passengers. Uh, for example, there was the first class, that was the most luxurious, but also the most expensive class. And there was also usually a doctor on board in order to take care of uh, the sick. So that's the context in which the quarantine station was modernized, starting in the 1870s, 1880s. So this modernization was uh, fostered by, of course, those scientific progress, but also uh, the rapid growth of immigration. Just for giving you an idea, between 1860 and 1920, more than 2.5 million immigrants arrived at the port of Quebec City. And they were from all over the world, from more than 40 different nationalities. So uh, the uh, station of Rossil rapidly became a scientific, rigorous and effective station focused on prevention, with a series of new technologies and knowledge being implemented by one man. Uh, it was Dr. Frédéric Montizambert. So who was he? Well, obviously he was a doctor. He was born in Quebec City and he has studied medicine at Université Laval in Quebec. So he eventually became director, so superintendent of the station in 1869, and he remained in office during 30 years. He could be described as an ambitious and modern scientist, so he wanted to stay aware of the latest uh, scientific findings. That's why he used to travel throughout the world, in France, in England, or in the United States. He even became, in 1899, the first director general of public health of Canada. So in a certain way, he was the ancestor of uh, the uh, Dr. Teresa Tam in Ottawa. So uh, you see, we had this person working at Grossil during the 1800s. And Montizambert had uh, many uh, new buildings uh, erected. For example, a hotel for uh, travelers, a disinfection building, or a new hospital. And even the island itself was divided in three separate sectors in order to avoid contamination. So there was a guardhouse and fences between those uh, different sectors. And uh, for example, in blue in the west, there was the hotel sector for the quarantine of the healthy immigrants, the ones who were kept under observation. In the center in green, there was the village of saint luc de Grosil, only for the employees and their families. So this village uh, reached a population of more than 250 inhabitants at the beginning of the uh, 1900s. And there was even a school for the children of uh, the employees. And finally, in the east, uh, in the red, uh, there was a sector for the hospital for uh, the isolation of uh, cases of sickness among uh, the immigrants. Now let's do a little uh, funny survey about Dr. Montizambert. Dr. Montizambert uh, went to the Pasteur Institute in 1889. He wanted to study uh, the science of microbes uh, and to take a look closer to the works of the scientist Louis Pasteur. So which city did he travel to? And here's a hint, there was a tower under construction. And take a look at that picture on, uh, on the right. So what was uh, the city he visited? Uh, London? New York, Geneva, Paris, Marseille, or Berlin. I invite you to uh, write uh, the number in uh, the uh, chat section. Fantastic. So our teachers that are live with us can do the chat inside StreamYard. Anyone on YouTube can type in the chat there. I think we all might have a hint together, uh, Shadi sharing the tower there. Uh, but if you guys want to start sharing answers, which city? London, New York, Geneva, Paris, Marseille, or Berlin? All right. Paris galore! I think uh, we got like 20 pairs all at once. No no one's being a rebel and typing in London or New York. I, I think we've got our answer, Shaddy. <laughs> yeah, congr congratulations, you are very good. Uh, actually, the right answer is uh, Paris. As you saw, there was the Eiffel Tower under construction in 1889 when uh, Dr. Montes Arbert visited Louis Pasteur and the Pasteur Institute. So I remind you that Louis Pasteur is a French scientist and the seat of the Institute uh, of the Pasteur Institute is still in Paris even nowadays. 
So now let's take a look closer to one of the innovations implemented by Dr. Montisambert at Rossil, starting with the disinfection. Disinfection is simply the destruction of microbes in order to avoid the uh, spread of diseases. It was mandatory for all immigrants at Grossil, and it was done inside a building called the Disinfection Building. It was built by Dr. Montisambert in 1892. And inside, we had huge steam chambers, so uh, metal ovens that were designed for the disinfection of luggage. So inside the chambers, there was dry steam that was uh, superheated at a temperature of uh, 115 degrees Celsius. Uh, this process would last between 30 and 45 minutes. Actually, uh, the carts full of luggage were pushed on uh, the ground using a rail system into the steam chambers. But some more fragile objects uh, couldn't support steam, for example, uh, leather, fur, uh, rubber, or jewelry. So those ones were taken apart and disinfected separately uh, using a uh, disinfecting liquid called mercury uh, bichloride. So while the luggage were disinfected, the immigrants too had to be disinfected using one of the 44 disinfecting showers of the building. So those showers were automated and they were activated by the employees of the station. So of course you had a shower head on the top, but also you had huge uh, metal hoops ensuring that all the body could be sprayed by a mix of hot water and mercury bichloride. That was the disinfectant used. After the shower, of course, everyone could leave uh, the building and was given a proof of disinfection so they could start their quarantine into the hotels. And if someone uh, would become sick, when uh, it was then transferred into the hospital sector for treatments. Now, let's take a look to the second video to the disinfection process. Awesome. Let's get this up. Highlight it for you guys. All right. Give me two quick seconds and we will play. Chauffer à 115 degrés Celsius afin d'éliminer toute forme de maladie. Vos effets personnels resteront près de 30 minutes à la hausse de température, alors que vous passerez à la douche désinfectante. Celle-ci se décline en deux étapes. Vous pourrez vous changer en toute intimité dans la première cabine afin de nous remettre vos vêtements et ainsi les soumettre à la désinfection dans les études. Now, of course, uh, everyone was given back, uh, obviously, uh, their disinfected clothing at the end of uh, the shower, and then they were given their certificate and could start their quarantine. So that was the disinfection. Another innovation at Grossil uh, was the modernization of hospital care. Of course, the buildings themselves, the hospitals, had to be modernized first. I remind you that there was a sector solely for the sick, the hospital sector. In this sector, in 1881, uh, there is a new hospital that was erected. It was called the Marine Hospital. It was at the forefront of technology. It was equipped with more than 100 beds, with a surgery room, a pharmacy, and a disinfection equipment uh, that was found into the laundry. So you had a disinfecting baths or also other washing machines. There is even an ambulance, a horse-driven ambulance, uh, that was bought in 1889. It was pulled by a horse, and it was used for the transportation of patients from the wharf to the hospital's uh, sector. Uh, 
And there's also one of the old lazarettos from 1847 that was transformed into a smallpox hospital. So smallpox was another uh, very uh, dangerous disease. This disease is now disappeared, but at that time it was one of the most contagious and most frequent diseases. It was characterized by fevers, by postules and spots covering the entire body and letting permanent scars. And patients were often uh, photosensitive, so uh, it meant that they were sensitive to sunlight. So that's why in 1904, there's a red room that was installed into the lazaretto. It was equipped with red glasses uh, in the windows. So uh, those windows could filter the sunlight and then block uh, the UV rays. It would, reduce, it would reduce skin damage and symptoms. Uh, it was very efficient. It was based on uh, real uh, scientific findings. There's also laboratories uh, that uh, were installed at Grossil. Those were a major technological advance. They were designed for the analysis of samples taken from patients in order to identify the diseases. And scientists at that time used incubators. An incubator is the machine you can see at the center of the slide. They are used to grow uh, colonies of uh, bacteria in order to uh, identify easily uh, a disease. So even nowadays, uh, laboratories are still used for uh, the detection and identification of uh, viruses and bacteria. That's the case when uh, you uh, get tested uh, for COVID-19. All the samples are uh, taken to uh, laboratories. At Grossil, uh, the first lab was built in 1892 by Dr. Montizan-Père into a former wash house. In the hospital sector, there was also a uh, more efficient staff uh, with uh, modern treatments. Uh, for example, in 1914, there were more than 20 employees, including nurses, physicians, and support staff. And all the old treatments uh, were gone. They had been replaced by softer and more effective therapies, like basic, uh, basic hygienic care, uh, bathing, or uh, modern medicines like aspirin, ointments, or serums. Uh, even, uh, in the hospitals, we uh, use at that time antiseptics or sterilized equipment. And all of the immigrants, as soon as in 1886, had to be uh, vaccinated against smallpox. So it brings us to the end, to the conclusion of this presentation. I'm sure that you are now well aware that uh, science uh, had a central role into uh, the development of the quarantine station of Grossil. And uh, as you learned, during the second half of the 1800s, the station uh, was gradually modernized in order to become an efficient uh, station due to a series of technological and medical progresses. But as you maybe know, uh, history is never completely over. Uh, those epidemics and those contagious diseases, uh, for some of them, are still part of our daily life. And that's the case for uh, COVID-19, among other things. So there will always be uh, new challenges and new uh, knowledge uh, to learn if we want to uh, continue protecting our population. But sometimes it can be useful uh, to look back at the past and try to learn from the lessons of history. And that's exactly what you can do uh, when uh, taking a look at the history of Grossil. It's a testimony of the importance of science for the protection of public health. And Parks Canada does not protect only uh, wood or stone at Grossil, it protect the memory of uh, that history. And if you ever come to Grossil this summer to visit us, well, you will... Uh, learn more about that history and maybe you will have uh, the time to try the showers also so thank you for your attention and now that's the, per the question period thank you so so much shadi that was fantastic man uh the comments on youtube are amazing people are really really keen on this and it's such a nice opportunity to sort of highlight a, a historical context and something that's so topical today i can say personally that i'm really glad i didn't have to do quarantine back then uh streaming services and food delivered to my door are a really fantastic modern luxury so thank you for the context there and the great videos um as shadi said we're going to dive in with questions guys we've got a ton of you joining on youtube at least 12 classrooms from across north america uh plus our live groups so we're going to start with Ms. Wood's class joining us live. If you want to kick us off and come on in, if you have questions from your class, go for it and uh, take us away. Hi, Ms. Wood. Hi. Uh, I'm looking at my uh, oh, I'm looking at my class chat because we joined on uh, through Microsoft Teams. I'm streaming to them, so I'm not seeing too too many questions. Okay. 
Jeez. I can come back in a minute. And by the way, you're in Russell, Ontario. Welcome in, guys. So I'll come back and check in in just a little bit. Perfect. All right. Thanks. All right. Actually, to give our live classes just a second to get their you know, thinking caps on, I'll take one from YouTube. Um, we've got a whole bunch of questions from Mr. Shattuck's class, from Ms. Mustard's class about gross eel today. Could it be used to treat COVID patients? Is this something that's still in use? Um, any capacity for this sort of thing nowadays? Uh, unfortunately, we couldn't use uh, gross steel uh, for the current uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Most of the buildings are outdated and they are now uh, more uh, like a museum. Uh, but even if that station had still been in operation, uh, we have to recognize that the situation is quite different now uh, from what it was in the end of the 1800s. Uh, the transportation means used were essentially boats, so it was slower, it was easier to isolate cases of diseases. While nowadays we have everyone arriving from everywhere into airports, into train stations and ports, so uh, it would be more difficult to uh, try to catch all those people and put them into a few of those places. You can see that uh, the, the government had a very hard time to try to uh, do this. Fantastic first question, guys. And I love our question from a live class next. Miss Elchuk asked a question that I was going to ask if no one uh, did it. So Miss Elchuk's joining us in Dorog, Ontario. Uh, come on in, unmute your mic and uh, take us away. <laughs> All right, so we had a few questions. Uh, one was we were wondering about mercury bichloride and the name mercury has us kind of suspicious as to whether that was actually a good idea. Um, yeah. We understand it was working to disinfect, but was that bad for people? Yes, we obviously know nowadays that using mercury is not uh, the best idea. Uh, it's uh, not uh, completely safe. It wouldn't be accepted by Health Canada. Uh, but uh, the proportion of mercury was quite low. Uh, we're talking about uh, one part of mercury bipyride uh, and 1,000 parts of uh, water. So it's a very tiny proportion. Uh, and uh, no side effects were noted among both employees or immigrants after their passage uh, at uh, Rossil. But it wouldn't be accepted nowadays, however. <laughs> Probably for the best, but that's really good to know. And I love that context. So thank you, Shadi. Uh, let's go to Connect Charter School in Alberta with Ms. McQueen's class. Just unmute your microphone, guys, and come on in. Hi. All right. Hey, hey, hey. Hello, everyone. All right. Julia, can you come forward a little bit and ask your question, please? Good. Uh, are there graveyards and where they are? So, are. Yeah, please do repeat, Ms. McQueen. Are there, uh, how did, how are there graveyards on the island? Yeah. Oh, for sure. There are three different graveyards uh, on uh, the island. Uh, during the entire history of the station, uh, there's been a total of 7,553 persons that were buried in one of those, two, uh, of those three graveyards. The most important one being the Irish Cemetery, especially due uh, to the high number of deaths in uh, 1847. And uh, even nowadays, when you come to Grosil, you can visit those cemeteries, especially uh, the Irish Cemetery. Great question, guys. All right, we're going to go back to Miss Wood's class. They've got a question in the chat, so come on in live, and then Mr. Wolf, I'll come to you in just a second. So, Miss Wood, come on in. Hi. Hi. So, um, so I had a question. We had a question about what would be considered worse, uh, COVID nineteen or smallpox. Uh, I must and I must answer the truth. It's smallpox that was infinitely worse uh, than uh, COVID nineteen. Yeah. If you take a look at uh, the mortality rates uh, of uh, COVID-19, it's around 1% or a bit less. While uh, when we're talking of smallpox, uh, there were mortality rates sometime, uh, sometimes uh, raising uh, more than uh, 10%. So over 10 percent and sometimes even 50 percent in some cases. For example, uh, many uh, Aboriginal people in North America were decimated by uh, smallpox uh, pandemics. And uh, if we talk about the uh, urines in uh, near Lake Huron in Ontario, uh, almost the entire population of uh, that First Nation uh, was decimated in the 18th and uh, century. 
So uh, this disease was extremely uh, contagious and extremely frequent at that time. It's considered to be uh, the most uh, frequent disease in the entire history of humanity. That's why this disease uh, was eradicated after a global vaccination campaign that ended in the 1870s. So maybe uh, your parents or grandparents have received uh, the, that vaccine that usually led uh, a scar on uh, the shoulder. Yeah. Uh, I'm so glad you provided all that context. It's amazing. Um, so just a quick clarification, 1970s, 1980s, so actually fairly recently in our lifetime, we eliminated smallpox, which is the, one of the greatest public health achievements of all time. Um, right now, we're actually witnessing another one with the development of vaccines in about a year to be rolled out around the world for a major pandemic that was identified a year ago is nothing short of a medical miracle. So I'm really glad we got the smallpox context leading into this. So thank you so much for that, Shani. Um, guys, let's go to Mr. Wolf's class in the delightfully named town of Beaver Bank, Nova Scotia. Uh, if you guys have a question for us, unmute that mic and come on in. Besides smallpox and cholera, cholera what were some of the other diseases? Some, some of the other diseases. Nice. <laughs> So actually, uh, various diseases uh, were treated, obviously, uh, at the quarantine station. Uh, but the main ones were called the quarantine disease. Uh, so there was uh, yellow fever, there was uh, cholera, there was plague, uh, there was uh, smallpox, uh, smallpox and typhus. Those were the five most dangerous diseases, and they were classified as being uh, quarantine uh, diseases. Uh, I told you about uh, typhus that uh, struck the uh, Irish immigrants in 1847. So this disease was characterized by fevers, uh, by postules, and by uh, gangrene. Uh, there were numerous other diseases, uh, most of them being uh, some kind of uh, fevers, like uh, typhoid fever, uh, for example. Uh, or uh, even flu, flu uh, sometimes uh, became a very dangerous uh, disease, like the Spanish flu uh, at the beginning of the uh, 1900s. It was not uh, literally a quarantine uh, disease, but it, necessita it necessitated uh, the uh, implementation of uh, some particular efforts in 1918. Great questions, guys. We are going to have time for another round of questions with all our live groups, but I wanted to take a few from you two before we uh, come back. So Miss Wazalek's grade seven class asked a great question. How do they keep the staff safe from all those diseases? They're picking up these clothes, they're picking up the bags, walking people through. Uh, did they keep the staff safe? Uh, actually, at the beginning, not at all. So that's why many of the employees in the early 1800s died and had to be buried uh, to, into uh, the cemeteries of the quarantine station. Many priests, many uh, sailmen uh, too. Uh, but eventually, with uh, the uh, advent uh, of uh, new disinfection methods, the employees uh, could be uh, kept safe uh, more easily. Uh, for example, all of the employees working into the disinfection building had to be uh, disinfected too using uh, the disinfecting showers. Uh, the nurses working in the smallpox hospital had to be uh, vaccinated uh, against uh, smallpox. So only a few cases uh, of diseases among the employees were noticed uh, at the beginning of the, uh, of the 1900s. That was due to those uh, new techniques. Very, very cool. I love this question from Miss Babbitts too. Does the island have an archive if you want to find your ancestors? If people came through that quarantine station, is there a way to find out who did? Well, actually, on the website of Parks Canada, you can access a database uh, containing all the names uh, of the persons buried into uh, the cemeteries of the station. And you can also uh, take a look at another database containing many names of, uh, uh, of immigrants who passed uh, through the port of Quebec City and the quarantine process. Not all of them, because many of those records are, were lost. Uh, but uh, we have uh, tens of thousands of uh, immigrant names from the 1800s and the 1900s. Yeah, I know it's not specifically your site, but my experience at Pier 21 in Halifax, for anyone who might be on our East Coast, uh, the archives there and the history there of people coming into Canada was truly one of the most impactful and amazing things I've ever experienced at a Government of Canada site in the country. So I really encourage people to check that out when it's uh, open and safe to do so uh, in the future, as well as Gross Eel and, and other archives across Canada. It's a really special experience to trace that history, especially for a country built on immigrants like we are. Um, one more question from YouTube. Let's see. So many questions from you guys, it's hard to keep track. Uh, let's take one from 
Oh, geez. Mr. LeBrun's class. So they have a whole bunch of questions. Uh, how long did people stay there if they were sick or if they weren't sick? Well, uh, first of all, all of the ships uh, passing in front of the island <clears throat> had to undergo a medical inspection. If there was no case of sickness aboard, uh, well, everything was all right and they could continue to, their way towards Quebec City. But if there was a, a case of diseases, uh, people had to be quarantined and uh, the sick immigrants had uh, to be transferred into the hospitals. Uh, the duration of uh, the quarantine uh, was quite different if you compare uh, the beginning of the 1800s and the beginning of the 1900s. So before uh, the, those discoveries by Louis Pasteur, especially uh, about uh, microbes, we still ignored the origin of those diseases. And of course, we ignored the incubation period of diseases, so the time it takes before symptoms develop. So uh, it was quite kind of approximative. It would, use, it would usually uh, last from six to 20 days, uh, depending on the affluence at the station. But eventually later, the uh, duration of the quarantine was uh, adjusted to uh, the different types of diseases. For example, smallpox has an incubation period of around two weeks. So it means that if you suspect that symptoms of smallpox uh, may develop, well, you have to wait two weeks, while for cholera it's only a few days. So uh, the uh, duration of that quarantine was very different from one case to another. Yeah. This, you are fantastic at providing all the context of these answers. This is great, Shadi. Uh, let's do three more questions. We're going to go a little bit over time, but we're rebels, so we'll do it together. Uh, Ms. Elchuk, if you have another question for us, unmute that mic, come on back in, and go for it. Hi there. Oh, unmute if you can. Sorry. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> My no students are always reminding me. Thank you. <laughs> um, so yeah, one uh, question was about, uh, can you still visit Gross Isle today? Um, and then there was another one that was, oh yeah, um, right. They were asking, you sort of partly answered this already, but uh, do the viruses uh, still exist today that they were quarantining for at the time? So we know that smallpox um, has been eliminated, which is excellent, but how about the other ones? Yes, uh, so uh, for the first uh, question, well, uh, it's right, you can still visit Grosil nowadays. We usually open uh, between May and October. You can take a boat or a plane and come visit us and you'll uh, get the, you have a chance to visit the disinfection building to try the showers, well, not with real mercury vitride, uh, but uh, still you will also have the time to visit the cemetery or the lazarette with the red room. And about uh, viruses and bacteria, well, most of those diseases uh, that were uh, uh, seen at Grossil at that time, they still exist nowadays. For example, cholera, uh, but uh, they are far less uh, frequent uh, nowadays than they were at that time. But still, uh, a few cases of cholera happened at New Orleans after uh, the uh, Hurricane Katrina uh, in the early, uh, I think it was in 2006. And even in Haiti, after uh, the earthquake, uh, there were several cases uh, of uh, cholera. So this disease is quite is still quite frequent in the world. Other diseases uh, too uh, still exist, like plague or uh, typhus, for example. But usually in our modern societies, uh, their incidence is very low. I, I think that's a fantastic message. You, I'm so glad you mentioned Haiti. I mean, these are diseases that, again, in Canada and the U.S., very seldom, if ever, are going to impact most of us. But in other parts of the world, uh, they can still play a major role in causing a lot of mortality. So it's really worth continuing the, the fight to try and eliminate these diseases where we can. There's a lot of organizations and governments around the world working to protect and, and do what they did for smallpox or other diseases. So I think there's a lot of research that you guys can do as classrooms to find out what some of those are uh, and see what's going on. It's, it's pretty exciting science. And it's a fact that hygiene is uh, closely related to uh, the fight against uh, diseases. So as soon as you have problems with uh, water supply or sewage uh, systems, it's a door open to the transmission of uh, many diseases like cholera that is easily transmitted uh, through contaminated water. So that's why it's so frequent after natural disasters or into uh, underdeveloped countries where there's no aqueduct or uh, water supply systems.
Yeah, here in Toronto, and, and I'm sure where you are too, Shadi, uh, if you turn on the tap, you have fresh, clean water that you can drink all day long. And that's a real rarity on the world scale, having traveled internationally. Uh, there's not many places that have that sort of infrastructure like we do. So we are very, very fortunate to have that in place. And uh, a big thanks to the government for making that possible. Uh, let's do two more questions, guys. Miss Wood, and then we'll go to Connect Charter to wrap us up. Uh, and finish off there. Hi, Ms. Wood. Hi. Um, so I've got some students wondering about the treatment for smallpox. So if they, if somebody came down with smallpox, how was it treated and what were some of the side effects of, uh, of whatever medication or treatment that they used? Well, actually, uh, when we're talking about the modern era, so the beginning of the uh, 20th century, there were soft treatments uh, that were provided to uh, patients. So uh, bathings, uh, sponging to ease uh, the symptoms or uh, ointments uh, that were uh, spread uh, on uh, the skin and on uh, the eyes uh, too. Uh, the diet uh, was also adapted uh, to uh, sickness. And obviously, there was also the red room that was used uh, for decreasing uh, the extent of uh, the postules and spots covering uh, the body through uh, the protection provided against uh, UV rays. So uh, treatments were not totally efficient, uh, but they could ease the symptoms and help people recovering uh, faster. Between the Red Room and that Plague Doctor bird mask, I can see why this is the fodder for a lot of horror movies. It's not exactly the yes. friendliest situation in the world. Um, let's wrap up with Ms. McQueen's class and Alberta Connect Charter students. Come on in, unmute your mic, and uh, take us away. All right. I have a question from um, the other class who's also watching. And uh, 5.1 wanted to know which was worse, the Black Plague or smallpox? Well, it's extremely hard to answer this question. Uh, Black Plague uh, is more focused into one uh, precise part of our history. So it's the Middle Age in Europe, and the impact uh, were uh, devastating at that time. Almost 30% of the population of Europe died of plague at that time. But fortunately, this uh, disease uh, was less frequent after. So uh, when we talk of the 1800s, there were only a few cases of smallpox uh, that were uh, recorded at uh, Grosseil, but smallpox was far more uh, frequent and uh, contagious uh, too. And according to most historians, smallpox uh, would be uh, the right answer as it is the disease considered to be uh, the most frequent and dangerous in the entire history of humanity because it was so constant and present in every uh, period of time. We do a lot of animal programs at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. It's always the superlative questions, the biggest, the strongest, the fastest. So I think we have definitively laid out the showdown of all time diseases and smallpox is the winner. So yes, <laughs> but definitely it will be a titan fight. It's a, yeah, <laughs> we've had Kong versus Godzilla references in the chat bar, so we'll, we'll call those uh, our, our two champions. Um, Shadi, this has been so fantastic. Before we wrap up, I just want to bring up a few things for our classes at home and on YouTube, um, and then we'll wrap up in just a second. Uh, what a fun adventure. So many classes tuning in, and again, such a topical uh, thing for today's society. Uh, we're all hoping to be out of our pandemic very soon, but it's really fascinating to learn a little bit about the history of how we dealt with infectious diseases in the past. So if you guys are keen, uh, we're going back to the Northwest Territories uh, just next week to Nahani National Park. Check out our Cross Canada virtual road trip link below. If you want to see our partner organizations in this amazing journey across Canada, check out pc.gc.ca for Parks Canada's website and rcgs.org for Canadian Geographic Education. Uh, looking so very forward to having you back. And if you go to our YouTube channel as well, you'll see this program in a playlist as well as our programs in French. We've been doing every single journey across the country in both official languages. Uh, Shadi, before we wrap up today and we give our, our last two classes a chance to say goodbye before heading out. Uh, is there any last message you want to share with us about Gross Eel and the story of quarantining uh, there? Well, I already told you uh, earlier that uh, what we protect mainly at Grosil uh, is uh, about memory, not about stone or walls. Uh, so that we can learn about the lessons of the past. But there's one other thing you have to realize too. For most of those immigrants, Grosil was not the end. It was the beginning of a new life, since most of them did actually survive and were able to continue their way to, uh, towards their final destination. So Grosil must not be uh, must not be seen as something that is sad, but something that was only uh, the great the great way for a new life in, in Canada and North America. 
What a beautiful message to leave us on, Chatty. Uh, thank you so, so much again, personally. And what we do at the end of every broadcast, I'm going to bring in our remaining teachers if you have to head out for the end of their day. But Miss Wood and our Connect Charter team, if you guys want to join me in saying a big thank you and farewell to Chatty today, come on in uh, and we'll end it there.